Well, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here tonight. Um, first and foremost, I want to extend my gratitude to the BBVA Foundation for honoring us uh, for this prestigious award. Um, it's recognition for the diligent and courageous team at Manga Bay, a group of passionate staff and contributing journalists who pers persist in their commitment to telling stories that matter despite the risks that this work can bring. So as the, uh, the video showed, um, Manga Bay was really inspired by my love of nature. So in the mid-1990s, I had this opportunity to visit Borneo, absolutely beautiful forest. Um, this forest was destroyed. And so that devastating transformation of this incredible ecosystem ignited my journey to start Manga Bay. Um, over the years, I've certainly borne witness to uh, the escalating environmental destruction globally. Um, indeed, uh, there are a lot of things to, to be upset about. Um, 2023 was the hottest year on record. Uh, we've seen severe droughts from the Amazon to Sumatra. Uh, and species extinction rates have soared to a thousand times the normal. And in the first few weeks of 2024, we've already experienced uh, the warmest ever ocean temperatures. Um, we've received new evidence that the meridional, the Atlantic meridional overturning current is showing early signs of collapse. Um, we've had scientists accelerate the time frame for the die-off of the Amazon rainforest, and we've seen torrential storms in Southern California, just to name a few things. Um, these alarming statistics could easily lead uh, to despair and inaction. Yet Manga Bay remains committed to documenting these harsh realities. Um, in fact, I've been told that Manga Bay is the most depressing site on the internet. Um, despite these grim observations, there's room for hope, fueled by, our story, fueled by stories from our global network of journalists who are delivering news from nature's front line. This isn't about naive optimism, it's about being realistically hopeful recognizing emerging trends that could help us mitigate these crises. So I'm gonna go through some of these trends that make me hopeful. So one is uh, a shift from poverty-driven to profit-driven deforestation. So this seem, may seem a bit counterintuitive, um, but this is a shift in who's re most, most responsible for the largest proportion of environmental degradation worldwide. So today, a growing share of damage is driven by corporations and governments rather than subsistence activity. Um, in other words, we're moving from profit-driven deforestation, or sorry, poverty-driven deforestation to profit-driven profit, profit -driven, uh, deforestation, which also extends across a wide range of environmental issues. So we're moving from this, where it's, this is an example of deforestation, so smallholders cutting down forests primarily to feed their family, to this is large-scale deforestation primarily by companies. Sure, companies have a lot more capacity to deforest or destroy the environment, but there are fewer of them. So the reason that's significant is it narrows the focus uh, to fewer entities who are causing major planetary harm. Um, so what that means is, again, tackling deforestation just to cite one issue once meant that you had to work with uh, poor farmers to protect forests while the, they're primarily just trying to put food on the table for their, for their families. Um, this meant debate, devising uh, sustainable livelihood strategies for rural, rural populations, which is an issue we've been trying to deal with for um, half a century. Um, now most deforestation is driven by commodity production for urban, uh, urban markets and export markets. So saving forests often involves in urging companies and governments to adopt more environmentally sustainable practices that don't necessarily undercut productivity or profitability and can yield other gains um, like better supply chain management. So this shift, and this is what it looks like if, if we look around the world. So um, what we can see in, is in most parts of the world, um, the, the, the primary driver of deforestation is now not shifting agriculture or smallholders, it's corporate, govern, uh, co corporate actors and governments. Um, and so what this means is uh, this shift has created new opportunities for activists by giving them leverage and tools to push for change, because it means they're going after a smaller number of companies. So a good example of this um, was um, a series of Greenpeace campaigns that began in the mid-2000s. So in the years that followed those campaigns, which really targeted these large commodity producing companies, um, also companies that source commodities from the tropics, um, so in the years that followed, hundreds of companies committed to eliminate deforestation from their supply chains. So these are called zero deforestation commitments. Um, these weren't just Western companies, they ended up becoming some of the largest companies in the world, many of which were primarily Asian. Um, 
that said, a lot of these, uh, these companies fell short on those commitments. And so what happened was, is in the late, late 20 teens and in the 2020s, um, governments have been uh, adopting policies to, um, to limit deforestation um, that's related to certain uh, commodities. Um, and so the results of this have been, have been real. Um, so deforestation associated with palm oil in Malaysia and Indonesia has de de uh, declined by about 90% since the peak um, about a decade ago, while Amazon deforestation for soy has also declined sharply. Um, but again, there's a long way to go. A lot of companies are falling short of their, of their promises, which brings me to the second thing that I'm excited about, which are there are more tools uh, than ever before to monitor and um, verify compliance. Um, and so a lot of that's being driven by remote sensing, which means we no longer have ignorance for an excuse uh, for not taking action. So various, plat various technological platforms, uh, primarily satellites, but other ones as well, um, is creating unprecedented transparency. Um, and these, some of these tools are allowing near real-time insights into our planet's condition. So again, we no longer can say we didn't know what we're doing. We can clearly see what's happening. Um, data from satellites, camera traps, and bioacoustic devices are now being widely used by uh, a huge number of actors to see what's happening on timescales that are relevant for action. And so this is having a real impact. Um, research by the Climate Policy Initiative attributed about 60% of the drop in deforestation in Brazil and Amazon over a five-year period to the company's uh, deforestation monitoring system. That deforestation monitoring uh, cap uh, capability has now gone well beyond Brazil. It's been expanded around the world and has advanced far beyond where it was even just five years ago. Um, there's even now radar systems that allow um, observers to see through clouds and smoke. So that means that we can now detect changes in forest cover that used to be totally obscured. So this is, this is a real technological advancement that has significant implications for trying to address deforestation. Um, additionally, planets, uh, our platforms like Planet have greatly increased the frequency of updates. So Planet, planet satellites uh, fly over every point on Earth's land surface twice a day and take photos. So again, it's allowing, it's creating a lot of capability and that data is freely available on certain platforms like Global Forest Watch, which means it's greatly democratized access to this data, which 20 years ago is only available to governments and companies that could afford it. So again, this means it's, it's, it's harder to hide um, bad actors find it harder to hide. So one of my favorite examples of the power of satellites um, comes from a Manga Bay investigation that was published several years ago. So in 2014, there was a company that had an IPO in London and it raised millions of dollars. Um, the company portrayed itself as a good corporate citizen. It said it was working with indigenous people. Um, it was protecting, it was helping regrow the rainforest. Um, it was producing this uh, product that people love in a responsible way. It was a really nice story, but it ended up being completely false. The problem was that no one really knew it at the time. So while the company was celebrating its IPO in London, images in the Proving Amazon showed this large-scale forest clearing that was scaling up very rapidly. Um, so Mangabe started to dig into this issue. Um, we used the satellite data as a starting point. We sent uh, reporters in to see what was happening on the ground. We worked with local journalists, and we found that that company was actually clearing this primary forest. Um, this forest is some of the most biodiverse part of the Amazon. Um, and so we, um, we prepared to come out with a story. The uh, company was aware that we were publishing it, and they told us, well, actually, a law firm told us they were going to sue us out of existence if we published a story. Um, I thanked them for their message, and I said, this story is based on the best science available. You don't have libel or slander. So thanks for your message. We're just going to proceed with this story. Um, the law firm ended up dropping the company as a client. Um, our story came out, and there was immediately picked up by a, a large number of international media outlets and local media outlets. So the story um, went really big. And so what that did is it created uh, an ecosystem where a wide range of actors could then do campaigns around this issue. So um, activist groups started to do, uh, put pressure on uh, banks and financiers. Um, the Peruvian government ended up uh, revoking the permit of the company, so it, could, it was no longer able to operate. Um, and then two years later, the company was delisted from the London Stock Exchange. So the reason that was significant is that uh, it, was, it had been planning to raise capital to clear another 100,000 hectares of forest for oil, palm, cacao plantations. Um, and so because of that delisting, um, 
the destruction of that 100,000 hectares did not occur. So in climate terms, that's about 30 million uh, metric tons of CO2 emissions that, wasn't, that didn't end up in the atmosphere. That's equal to about 72 billion uh, miles driven by passenger car. So just to, sorry, I skipped a few slides there, but that's, that's, you know, that's the impact of this ecosystem of, of actors who, uh, who came together around this issue. Um, so beyond satellite data, uh, technology is providing new insights. Um, for example, there's another platform called Global Fishing Watch, which is very similar to Global Forest Watch, which is offering unprecedented insights into what's happening in the world's oceans, including illegal fishing that was a previously undetectable at scale. So this is a paper that came out recently that looked at fishing vessel activity um, with, uh, with um, vessels that had their AIS system, which is used for tracking, turned on versus when they would turn off their systems. And so what this revealed is that a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, fishing operators were moving into sensitive areas um, when they turned off their tracking system so they could um, essentially pillage the oceans illegally. Um, and so that sort of information leads to real action. So this is a, a list of 25 Spanish um, flish, uh, fishing vessels that were sanctioned for turning off their AIS systems. Um, so yeah, this can have real impacts. So another uh, really you know, exciting area where there's a lot of uh, uh, development right now is um, around the analysis of the sounds that organisms make in an ecosystem, which is otherwise known as its soundscape. So that kind of information is, is really useful. It can tell us how ecosystems are faring, whether they're doing a, a better or worse relative to historical levels, and what effects different conservation interventions are having. So this is some research that was published relatively recently, which shows that, and I, I realize it's probably hard to read, but what it's basically showing is more diverse ecosystems have more diverse land, uh, soundscapes. So that means that the sounds, more of the sound spectrum is saturated or occupied by calling animals, so insects, frogs, and birds, and mammals. And so this sort of information is really valuable in terms of tracking what's happening in a forest because you don't necessarily have good data on individual species, but you can measure what's happening across the whole soundscape and, and see trends. So really important stuff, but it's also interesting because it can even facilitate action on, on timescales um, relevant for addressing deforestation, poaching, or dynamite fishing in oceans by offering the capability to send real-time alerts when certain sounds, whether it's a gunshot, a chainsaw, underwater explosion, or an engine are detected. Um, so combining data like this with um, data from places like satellites, camera traps, environmental D DNA, is providing a much fuller picture of on the condition and trajectory of an ecosystem or the ecologically, ecological community than a single source. And it's certainly far better than we had just even a few years ago. Um, new data sources and capacity to analyze big data sets are also improving our understanding of how healthy and productive ecosystems underpin human well-being and why other species matter. So what the effect that this is having is it's broadening the constituency for conservation. So let me explain what that means. So we now have a be much better sense of how biodiversity contributes to carbon sequestra sequestration, just to name one example. So we understand that a forest that is full of megafauna and other important keystone species stores more carbon than one that's, that, that's been stripped of its, of its animals. Um, so we've always had an you know, intrinsic sense about that, but now we actually have the data to show, you know, to quantify that, which is really important. So um, for example, um, when a large whale dies and sinks to the bottom of the ocean, uh, it sequesters about 33 tons of carbon dioxide on average. And that carbon is then stored for centuries. So just remember that, I'll come back to it in a minute. There's also been a ton of research showing that uh, elephants are ecosystem engineers that play a really critical role in ensuring a forest ecosystem stores carbon. So a study published last year in Nature Climate Change, a journal, um, extrapolated on the concept of animating the carbon cycle or the idea of helping uh, populations of animals uh, recover um, which can accelerate the uh, rate of carbon sequestration and storage in ecosystems. So that study looks specifically at nine species or groups of species around the world. So that ranges from whales to bisons to sharks. Um, so reintroducing those nine species could lead to the capture of 6.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide annually, 
or more than 500 billion gigatons in total carbon removal by 2100. So that doesn't really mean much to people probably, but that's um, most of the amount that scientists say needs to be removed to ensure global warming remains between 1.5 degrees C, which we're already at. So again, really important. So restoring these populations implies, some, uh, implies that we're conserving some of the world's most biologically rich and productive habitats and the services they afford as well, which you know, can range from stabilizing ecosystems to buffering against extreme weather events um, and maintaining precipita precipitation patterns. Just for example, 70% um, of South America's GDP is, uh, is produced in areas that are fed by rainfall from the Amazon. So if the Amazon tips to a much drier ecosystem, um, that has significant implications for um, South America's economy. So you know, it's a really big deal. Um, this kind of research can also in, usher in new innovations. So last year I met with a philanthropist who has proposed a pretty interesting idea, um, paying ship captains a portion of the carbon value of a whale as a mechanism to incentivize um, those captains to avoid whale strikes. Um, so each ship would be outfitted with a pair of drones that would fly ahead of the ship several miles and when a whale is sighted, that information would be conveyed back to the captain um, at, on a time scale where the captain could actually take evasive action to avoid a whale strike. Um, and if the whale strike was avoided, um, the captain would be paid uh, several thousand dollars as, as a bonus, essentially. And so this philanthropist would put up the money for that system. So pretty interesting idea, um, kind of out there, um, but I think pretty, you know, pretty fascinating. Um, so the benefits of thriving ecosystems and their constituent species um, extend far beyond carbon and uh, carbon storage and wildlife habit, uh, habitat. So that includes human health, uh, more resistant, uh, resilient agriculture and water supplies, and buffering against storm damage and erosion. Um, this knowledge offers the opportunity to broaden the constituency for environmental protection. After all, the escalating severity of environmental degradation is inadvertently but progressively making environmental storylines relevant to more people, provided they provide the science. So again, these issues are touching people personally, so now they have a vested interest in understanding um, what's happening in the world around them. So it's making environmental journalism even more relevant. Um, but even if people aren't con uh, concerned about the science, people are thinking about conservation or protecting nature uh, in new ways based on broadening the constituency um, around uh, protecting nature. So one of my favorite examples um, comes from Indonesian Borneo. So this is a, an absolutely beautiful forest in West Kalimantan. Um, and so uh, I guess it was 15 or 20 years ago now, um, there was a woman who went to this forest to study um, orangutans. And, she found, she was very distressed by the, the rate of habitat destruction of these, of these great apes. And so she went around and did village surveys and found that the number one driver of deforestation was, um, health, was, was a, a health, health crisis for local populations. So what would happen is when someone had a health emergency, um, they would um, go into the forest, cut down a valuable um, diptrocarp, and then sell it. And so that was driving a lot of incursions into the forest and then eventually the conversion to oil palm plantations. And so um, this woman, whose name is Kinnery, decided to go to med school in order to try to figure out a way to provide um, health care to these local communities to see if that could help, uh, help protect these, you know, the great apes. And so that's what she did. She came back and then she, she set up the system of um, where uh, there was a clinic where communities could get um, health care and the, the fee they paid for the healthcare depended on the community's um, efforts to reduce illegal logging. So communities where there was still illegal logging present, they would pay like the standard fee for very good healthcare. So healthcare was so good that doctors from the hospital in the capital nine hours away would come by bus to come to the clinic. So everyone had ha ha access to this healthcare. But the communities that eliminated um, illegal logging would get subsidized health care. And so a study came out a few years ago to, to look at the impact of that. And there was a dramatically lower rate of, of illegal logging in the communities that, uh, that, that, that uh, you know, that, uh, that basically uh, got the subsidized health care. So it created this internal system, peer pressure system within these communities to phase out illegal logging. The really interesting thing was about this, though, was the co-benefits. So um, if people don't have money to go to the healthcare clinic, they can um, pay with their time. 
Um, and one of the things they can do is work in an organic garden. And it turned out that uh, in this area, a lot of subsistence, uh, subsistence agriculture requires a lot of chemical inputs. And so once a, uh, once a, a farm or like a, a local person had been trained in organic farming, they could shift away from those chemical inputs and start to produce vegetables, which are much more profitable. So not only did they get better health care, the, the deforestation went down, but they also um, saw their livelihoods increase. So that was a side benefit that no one expected. So that's a very specific example, but one manifestation in sort of this broadening of the constituency around uh, protecting nature is the flood of interest and money flowing into nature-based solutions. So that's everything from blue carbon to ecosystem restoration projects. So in 2022, an estimated $201 billion was directed in, direct, sorry, directly invested in nature-based solutions according to UNEP. So another thing that gives me hope is this concept of positive tipping points. So this was covered uh, in the video, but um, briefly, this idea has been advanced um, by Tim Lenton, who's um, at the University of, of Exeter. And so he's a proponent of, this, of, of the concept of these positive societal tipping points, which can lead to the rapid and profound changes in addressing climate change and sustainability issues. So these tipping points ref refer to small changes that can lead to significant shifts in how society beh uh, behaves and designs its systems, ultimately contributing to large-scale environmental benefits. So just some examples of what this looks like um, is uh, one is already happening, so it's the transition away from um, fossil fuel-powered um, vehicles to EVs. Um, so this has not reached a tipping point yet, but in some geography, in some countries like Norway, where, where um, well, now it's actually something like 80% of new cars sold um, are EVs. Um, it's, it, it's causing this transformation. And so, you know, you need the key, you need the key uh, elements in, in place, which are, you know, falling costs, uh, you know, longer batteries and policy support, but it can dr dramatically, uh, you know, change the conversation around emissions from transportation sector. Um, another example is the, um, sorry, these slides are kind of dark or light. Um, the renewable energy transition. So the rapid adoption of renewable energy technologies like solar, wind, geothermal, reaching a tipping point where they become economical and preferred over fossil fuels, leading to a swift transition towards um, clean energy around the globe. So already in some markets, um, renewable energy is cheaper than coal. So this is already happening. Um, and there's, there's good evidence to suggest we're nearing a tip, tipping point in some markets. Um, another tipping point that can happen is regenerative agriculture. So widespread adoption of rege regenerative agriculture practices, which restore soil health and sequester carbon, reaching a tipping point through uh, policy support, consumer demand, and farmer adoption. So again, this could dramatically reduce carbon emissions associated with farming, but also lead to positive outcomes for biodiversity. Um, another um, you know, potential tipping point is energy efficiency in buildings. So we're already seeing this with green design in the United States, but I mean, Europe is, uh, far ahead of the United States, but retrofitting buildings, uh, doing new green construction practices, becoming the norm, um, and you know just changing how much emissions are associated with new construction. Um, another uh, you know potential um, uh, tipping point is the increased focus on circular economy. So the idea of designing products that can be fully recycled or integrated back in supply chains. Um, so that was a pretty crazy idea like 20, 30 years ago, but now more and more companies are moving in that direction. There've also been a lot of advancements in sustainable materials. So bioplastics, recyclable composites, um, materials that are derived from waste products, and then reducing our dependency on uh, non-renewable renewable resources. Um, there are even replacements for lithium ion batteries that are emerging, which require little or no nickel. Um, so you know, we're even talking about some of these new battery technologies replacing battery technologies that really aren't that old. Um, so these positive tipping points are really important. Um, because they can synergize with each other and create a cascade of changes that can accelerate a transition to a more sustainable and resilient society. Um, so this concept un underscores the potential for deliberate actions and policies that leverage these tipping points, which could steer us towards meeting climate goals and making, uh, making our lives much more sustainable and therefore habitable for future generations. So in the conservation realm, uh, I don't know if we can call them tipping points yet, but some things are happening. So we're seeing substantial shifts 
and how organi organizations operate from how they measure success to how they interact with uh, frontline communities. So gone are the days where fortress conservation tactics are embraced without question. Um, today we're seeing a stronger emphasis on the role that indigenous peoples and local communities play in achieving conservation outcomes. So there's growing acknowledgement of the role that indigenous peoples and local communities play in maintaining healthy and productive ecosystems. Um, there's an ever expanding body of research which shows that community managed areas often have significantly lower rates of deforestation even than protected areas in some places. Um, these community managed lands are absolutely critical in protecting biodiversity and halting climate change. Um, so for example, something like 30%, 36% of the world's intact forests are within indigenous territories. Again, apologies, this is hard to read. So again, there's a number of studies that have shown lower rates of deforestation in the Amazon on indigenous territories compared to other lands, but even in some cases lower than protected areas. Um, indigenous territories um, in the Brazilian Amazon, so this is a recent study that came out, saw a much faster rate of forest recovery than areas that were outside their borders. So again, all significant evidence. So why is this the case? Well, indigenous people often have profound knowledge of their local environments developed over generations. That, gives, that intimate understanding allows them to manage their uh, ecosystem sustainably using traditional practices that have often proven effective in conserving biodiversity. Um, also for many indigenous communities, their territory and its natural resources are not just a means of subsistence, but also deeply intertwined with their cultural identity, their spirituality, and their heritage. This intrinsic connection offered, often uh, fosters a stewardship ethic that prioritizes health uh, and sustainability of their environments. Um, indigenous peoples are also gaining, increasingly gaining legal recognition for their lands and resources, which empowers them to manage their territories effectively and protect against external pressures, whether that's deforestation, mining, or agricultural expansion. Um, lastly, indigenous communities often pioneer uh, innovative conservation solutions that balance ecological health with the community well-being. So the, la the last major point I guess I'd emphasize is restoration is possible. So nature has shown remarkable resilience when it's been given a chance to recover. Protected areas and regulated industries have seen ecosystems rebound, endangered species recover, and water and air quality uh, improve in various places around the world. So last month, I had the great fortune of traveling to Raja Ampat, which is a region off of the northwestern tip of New Guinea. So Raja Ampat is a place of spectacular beauty. It has the highest marine biodiversity of any place on Earth. Um, it's also a place that offers hope in terms of nature's resilience. So 20 years ago, Raja Ampat's shark and ray population was substantially diminished by fishing, including shark finning. Conservation efforts, including a ban on commercial fishing and the establishment of no-take zones, often which were community-led, has resulted in a dramatic recovery of sharks and rays in some areas. So a recent study found that uh, about 10 point, uh, that manta ray populations saw a 10.7% uh, compound annual increase uh, in just a decade. Um, so that's unusual because rays globally are declining. So it bucked that trend. Um, anecdotally, dive operators, everything from modest homestays run by you know, a single family to resorts that cater to high-end, well-heeled uh, foreigners have reported a boom in populations around their lodges. The logic is pretty basic. When people see these animals are worth more alive than dead, they have a vested interest in maintaining their numbers. Um, this view even persisted during the pandemic when tourism completely collapsed in Raja Ampat. So there were reports of local communities banding together to protect sharks against finners during the worst of the crash. They believed that if shark populations were maintained, tourists would come back, and they did. Actually, one other trend that I should note is that um, lately demographic trends have, have positive, may have uh, positive implications for other species that share a planet. So the human population is now expected to peak before 2080 at about 10 billion, which is significantly lower than previous estimates. Uh, declining childhood mortality rates, uh, advancements in health and the empowerment of women are all contributing to this development. Of course, uh, consumption acts as a multiplier on population, so it remains a very important 
factor in our future. However, for the first time in centuries, humanity is navigating a future with a substantially smaller population and all the challenges that will involve. So these are among the many promising developments, um, but their impact is limited if they remain unknown. Awareness is a precursor to action, and that's where the pivotal role of journalism really comes into play. So journalism not only informs, but it also inspires and mobilizes public action. It's through well-researched, uh, compelling storytelling that engages the broader public and motivates them to participate in these solutions. So every challenge uh, presents an opportunity for solutions. Uh, addressing the environmental crisis uh, demands persistent collective action grounded in accurately conveyed facts. At Mongabay, we recognize this imperative and are increasingly employing situation, uh, sorry, are increasingly employing solutions journalism to approach environmental issues with a specific focus on solutions. So we're striving to move beyond doom and gloom, the most depressing side on the internet, um, by highlighting effective innovation strategies that can make a real difference. Um, by presenting these success stories, we aim not only to inform, but also to empower. Maintaining hope and optimism is vital in the face of daunting environmental challenges. These sentiments feel the creativity needed for new technologies, strategies, and approaches. Solutions Journalism plays a critical role in fostering this approach by showcasing um, how challenges can be and are being, come, and being overcome. This approach doesn't, doesn't just report on problems, it illuminates a path forward. So a prime example of journalism impact is evident in this story from Gabon, where we recently did coverage about a community struggle against a Chinese logging company. So our reporting on this community that had this forest, which it had been maintaining for generations in a healthy, you know, in, in a healthy state, um, was about to be logged by a Chinese logging company. Um, the reporting that we did drew the attention of Gabon's environmental minister, who ended up visiting the site. He was planning to stay there for a few hours. He ended up staying for multiple days. Um, after he returned, um, he revoked the company of uh, the operating permit of the company, and then recognized um, the company's um, right to protect the forest. So this was a landmark decision because it was the first time that an area was declared protected in Gabon at the request of a resident community. So Gabon had been known for this top-down conservation model, but this um, is now an ex a precedent for this bottom-up conservation model. So indeed, there are reasons to be hopeful. Sorry, let me go back one. The reasons to be hopeful. Um, history has shown that, uh, that societal change can, be, can happen rapidly on a large scale. The challenge isn't just about uh, changing quickly enough to avoid the worst environmental impacts. It's about uniting globally to amplify and expand solutions that are already in place. Journalism, especially data journalism, plays a crucial role in this endeavor. It provides the necessary rigor and accuracy to ensure our efforts are not merely uh, superficial greenwashing, but are genuinely effective. And to this end, tomorrow night, Mongo Bay is actually gonna be launching a new a data journalism initiative here in Madrid, actually, we're, we're announcing it. So if anyone is interested in that, uh, talk to me or my, my team here, um, and we can give you details on that. Um, so I believe journalism is not only a profession, it's, it's a duty to illuminate often uncomfortable truths that are essential for making change. And in the realm of environmental conservation, um, there's no question that journalism is really indispensable. So before closing, I would be remiss if I didn't address trends in the media landscape and the broader information ecosystem. So I think most people are aware that uh, it's, there, are, there are hard times now for news media. So these are just a few headlines from last year, but basically a lot of major media outlets are shutting down or laying off journalists. So again, challenging, there's some reasons for this. So news consumption is, is declining. So um, the top shows um, places with the biggest decline, and these are very substantial. So it's like 20 plus percentage um, point declines just in a, an eight year period. The best performing countries are also declining. So this is a, a significant trend around the world. People are turning, tuning out from news. So there's lots of reasons for this. People are getting um, bummed out um, by news. They don't trust journalists. Um, they don't like uh, you know, the coverage of, of depressing things. Um, and so there is a growing segment of the population that are actively 
ignoring the news. So uh, two years ago, it was about 38% of the 65 countries that were, that were surveyed. 38% of people uh, were actively avoiding the news. So you know, it's across geographies. It's a trend that's happening. It's real. Um, so one of the interesting things about this, oh, I guess a couple of other things to note. So another challenge for news media is the evolving social media landscape. So social media platforms are very much in flux right now. The algorithms are changing. It makes it really hard for journalists to focus on what they should be doing, which is just reporting on the issues. Instead, we're having to think about how do we actually reach and engage our audiences because um, every few months, uh, the rules are changing. And of course, we're dealing with uh, increased polarization. So many individuals are prioritizing, prioritizing content that affirms their political beliefs over factual information, which makes it even harder to engage audiences. So these are all major challenges for environmental uh, communicators. Um, but there are reasons why, there, there are ways to sort of navigate this. And so I think there's even hope you know, <laughs> in some of these very depress depressing trends. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is of people who self-identify as news avoiders, there are certain topics of news that they still read. So they read positive news, they read solutions, and they read explainer content. So that's, that's encouraging for, you know, for news media outlets. And um, Manga Bay had already started to scale up its solutions journalism coverage. I mean, we've been doing it for several years now, and I stumbled across this data last year, and it was fantastic because it validated these decisions that we were making. So in terms of like our, you know, what we're thinking about in terms of solutions journalism coverage, so we have series on things like indigenous-led conservation, um, conservation technology, and nature-based solutions. And so that content actually outperforms our average content. So what we're seeing, uh, you know, is congruent with what these, you know, these, these large-scale servers are showing. So again, it's, it's a way to cut, to reach some of the news avoiders is by, you know, looking at these issues through a different framing. Um, the other major issue is, or another major issue is polarization. So it's probably hard to read, but um, the, 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 dark, the dark dots are people who identify as being on the left. The lighter dots are the people who identify as being on the right. So the second, the second one up there is climate change and environmental news. So 64% um, of people who identify as being on the right who avoid the news actively avoid climate change and environment news. So if you're trying to convey environmental information, that's, that's challenging. So another way to look at this, though, is what news do news do, or what topics do news avoiders still engage with? Well, it's, um, it's finance, it's business, it's economics, it's health. Um, and so if we start to look at some of these environmental issues through a different lens, putting in terms that are relevant to these audiences, it's a way to engage them on this, on this content. So again, it's not about you know, having all of our stories be about the health implications of climate change, but it means you can write some stories to reach key decision makers who, are identify, who identify as being you know, on the right. So again, this, these, there's opportunities in this data. So again, I don't want to sugarcoat it. You know, the path is the path ahead is challenging, not just for news media, but for you know all the environmental crises that we're facing. Um, but you know, just to close out here, um, the journey of Manga Bay reflects a broader narrative in environmental conservation: the power of informed, engaged journalism to drive meaningful change. So, as we confront the multifaceted challenges of climate change and mass extinction the role of solutions-focused journalism becomes increase, increasingly critical, uh, crucial. It serves in a, as a beacon, guiding us through the complexities of these issues and offering tangible, inspiring examples of progress and possibility. The path ahead, again, is undoubtedly challenging. However, the relentless pursuit of truth with a focus on solutions, journalism has the power to do more than just document the state of the world. It can help transform it for the better. This mission, at its core, is an act of hope a belief in the capacity of informed action to create a more sustainable, equitable, equitable world for generations to come. So thank you.